Today, the king of rock and roll storytelling, Bill Flanagan. These are your friends and neighbors. Welcome to this audio-only episode of Friends and Neighbors, a Wagner Brothers podcast in which we discuss depth and simplicity in an often shallow and complex world. I'm Benjamin Wagner, and today, rock and roll impresario, Bill Flanagan. Bill was a celebrated contributor to Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, and Spy before joining Musician Magazine and ascending the masthead. In 1995, Bill joined MTV Networks. In his 20-year tenure as a programming executive, he invented VH1 Storytellers, CMT Crossroads, and many, many more series and specials that helped fans go deeper with their favorite artists. Today, Bill is a CBS News commentator, serious radio host, author of six books, Husband and Father. Back in the day, there were two reasons why I sought to be promoted to SVP at MTV News, Business Class, and Bill Flanagan. Somehow, I reasoned, the title would grant me the seniority to cold call Bill, visit his office, and pepper him with questions about how he managed to be a programming executive and author. How'd he make the time? How'd he find the ideas? Did he wrestle with art and commerce? Now that I know Bill, I know that he'd have welcomed me, whatever my title. But I got the promotion, sent the email, and rode that elevator bank up to Bill's piece of 1515 Broadway. Before I'd even settled into one of his twin cub chairs beneath his fully loaded floor-to-ceiling bookshelf, Bill asked, So what do you want to hear first? New Dylan or you too? New as in just mixed, unmastered. A few years later, I rode shotgun with Bill from Pensacola, Florida to Gulf Shores, Alabama. Windows wide, Kings of Leon blasting the whole way. For a guy who's fallen asleep beneath Moroccan stars next to Bono, it was tame stuff, but for me, it bore a whiff of Lester Bangs and William Miller. In Bill's most recent book, 50 in Reverse, our 65-year-old protagonist Peter Wyatt wakes up in his 15-year-old life, which must have felt sort of familiar to Bill as I fanboyed out on him, beginning with his childhood in Warwick, Rhode Island. So paint me a picture of Warwick, Rhode Island in like 1971. I'm guessing you're 16, 15, 17-ish. Yeah, I was born in 55, so I was 16 and 71. Well, Warwick is a a big space. It's a lot of land. It's it's a combination of, I suppose, about nine or 10 different villages, mostly mill villages, that when I was born were still kind of connected by farms, you know, a village, a farm, a village, a farm, a village, a farm. But as I grew up, all became sort of suburbs and malls and mm-hmm. 95 came through and then another superhighway intersected with it there. So I sort of got, saw the last gasp of the old New England uh, collection of villages and saw it turn into an exurb. And now Warwick looks like Los Angeles, as you know, as a lot of the country does, as yeah. a lot of the country does. Yeah, yeah. What, what was happening in music, culture, and politics, and, and what got you excited? Like, what really sort of woke you up to the world? Well, I suppose the big wake-up call when I was nine was the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Yeah, but you, it, sure. But that was for everybody. That was the shot heard around the world. How'd that go over in your house? Sorry to interrupt you. How'd that go over in I your- think the way it went over in everybody's house, you know? Everybody was, like, playing guitar on the tennis racket and jumping up and down and playing Meet the Beatles over and over. And, uh, you know, all the kids in the neighborhood wanted to be Beatles, preferably without the in-between part where you have to learn an instrument and really work at it. And, um, you know, I mean, it's pretty typical baby boom, mid 20th century America stuff. You know, I really flipped out for Bob Dylan when I was about 13 and started reading a lot of Rolling Stone and Crawdaddy and the rock press and finding out from that about stuff you didn't hear on the radio, you know, finding out about Leonard Cohen and Randy Newman and Mm, going deeper. Tim Buckley and music like that. So, you know, like a lot of people, it was kind of bifurcated. My musical taste was on the one hand, top 40 radio. And on the other hand, these records that you would take three buses to get into the weirdest record store in the strangest neighborhood in Providence to find some, you know, bootleg of basement tapes or something. Uh, And what was the name of that place? Or were there a few? I'd love that detail. I bet you remember. There were a few, yeah. it was, but I'm trying to think, I get them mixed up. The strangest one, and I can't think of the name of it. My, was it Bovee? No, Bovee's was a jazz club. There was a, a record store in downtown Providence around the corner from what would later be Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel, oh, that, right. where everything was just covered with dust. You know, I mean, but, and yet they would have weird bootlegs and strange old jazz records and stuff. And that was several bus trips. But I mean, I could name every record store in the area because, you know, they all had a personality. There was one guy in Warwick, actually, in one of the old mill villages 
who in the basement of his house sold nothing but singles, but had every single you could look for. So, you know, if you wanted something by the impressions or, you know, you, I mean, whatever weird old 45 you were hoping to find, you could find in this guy's basement. And unbelievably, after operating out of his basement for years, his house caught fire and he oh. died trying to save his records. Oh, tragic story. It's just such a different experience. Even my memory of the late 70s, early 80s and the way I had to ferret things out. And it was almost like digging for nuggets, right? And discovering. And then you'd find something related to it that opened up a whole universe around it. You know, it was a sense of it was valuable because you worked so hard to get it. And the other thing that I was thinking about the other day was people used to go over to other people's houses to listen to their records. Right. That was a big thing. You know, I can still remember... I went to a memorial service for a childhood friend who passed away last week in, in Rhode Island. And we, I, I saw people there who I was in school with when I was six years old. And we were talking about who had which records, that this guy had Tarkus by Emerson, Lake and Palmer. This guy had Grateful Dead records. And the guy who passed away had A Salty Dog by Procol Harum and the first James Gang album and the first Jethro Tull album. And it's amazing how 50 years later, those things still seem very vivid. At a certain point, I, I picked up a Rolling Stone in an airport and it just changed my perspective on that was my gateway, right? But then mm -hmm. it wasn't enough, right? And I be, started being a musician myself and I discovered musician. And years later, come to find that you had a seriously heavy hand in, in that publication. And so I was reading your work and, and so forth. So can you tell me how that came to pass? Musician Magazine was put together by a couple of guys from Massachusetts named Sam Holsworth and Gordon Baird. And they were the publishers and Sam was the original editor and art director. And it came out erratically at first. And then it had a weird schedule. It came out every six weeks. And a friend of mine in a band in Rhode Island gave me a copy and said, get a load of this. What, you know, before it was well distributed, it was, it was really pretty obscure. And I said, this is the best magazine I ever read. And I found out that there was a bookstore near the Prudential building in downtown Boston that got it. So I would drive up there just to buy it. And eventually, sometime around late 70s, I was at a recording session in New York, and I was introduced to Vic Garbarini, who was the managing editor. Uh -huh. And he had read my stuff in other publications. And he said, well, you got to write for us. And so it was, it was kind of a dream come true. You know, I, I stumbled into it. And then after writing for Musician for about five years, Vic left and I was offered his job. And, uh, you know, from there, there we went. I stayed, yeah. ten, I stayed there on staff for 10 years. So What's the origin story on your superheroism around being a writer? Like, when did you realize that was something you were good at and moreover, something that other people weren't as good at that you could keep doing? I mean, this is going to sound a little silly, but when I was about 12, I remember thinking that it was a drag that you could no longer say when growing up said, what do you want to do? <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't say cowboy anymore. You couldn't say astronaut. You couldn't say baseball player because they'd say, well, do you play little league? No. Well, that's, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> And I remember one day, I actually remember where I was. I was riding the escalator at the new Sears that had opened near my house. And sure. that's how much I had to do was ride, go right over to Sears <laughs> and ride the escalator. And I thought, you know, I'm a better writer than other 12-year-olds, at least the kids in my class. If I could just stay that much ahead till I'm 22, maybe I could be a writer. And even if I can't, at least if I tell people I'm going to be a writer, they'll kind of get off my back. It just seemed like a reasonable thing to say you were going to do. And I kind of stuck to that. You know, I mean, it became, I guess, self-fulfilling. If I had decided to tell people I was going to be, um, you know, a polar explorer, maybe I would have ended up doing that. What was the first assignment that was a truly challenging assignment that you had to wrestle with either some component of reportage or a relationship or go somewhere and do something that felt uncomfortable? Well, the first piece I wrote, it wasn't an assignment. No, nobody was going to give me an assignment because I'd never written anything. <laughs> but I had been a, an avid fan of Bruce Springsteen when he was playing around the area, as he, as he often was. And I thought, this guy is going to be like Elvis Presley. This guy is going to be my generation's Beatles. And, and for a while, my friends and I just enjoyed it as kind of a secret. We would say, like, we're going to the Louisiana Hayride tonight. And when he was working on Born to Run, I thought, you know, this is it. This album is certainly going to make him famous. So I'd like to interview him and write about him before it comes out. And that turned out to be a challenge. A, because I'd never written anything for publication. <laughs> and B, because, you know, unbeknownst to me, 
his uh, manager had shut down all interviews because he was holding out for the simultaneous covers of Time and News. Oh, right, right, right. So Bruce was doing his first show. Uh, I later found out it was the day he finished recording Born to Run. Mm. He finished mixing it in the morning. And they drove up to Providence to play a show at the Palace Theater there. And I went down in the afternoon when you could kind of walk in off the street. And of course, he wasn't there. But I saw the crew and I saw the, the backstage passes they were wearing, which was a kind of a black and white picture of Bruce looking out a window. So I went home and I made one and I had tickets for the show. And I, I went to the show with my friends. And uh, when it was over, I had my tape recorder and I just uh, walked up to the dressing room and showed him my backstage pass. And they let me in. And Bruce was in the shower. The guys in the East Street Band were all there. It was Steve Van Zandt's first gig as a member of the East Street Band. And so I started interviewing everybody in the band. And then Bruce came out of the shower and I started interviewing him and I did an interview with him. Then I said, can my buddy come in and take some pictures? And then I went to his next gig in Massachusetts and went backstage again, because now I knew everybody. And then went to, at the end of the week, he played the first show at the bottom line. And I went to that. So then I came home, I wrote it up as if I were writing the cover story for Rolling Stone. Sure. I had the photos and I took it to an underground paper called Fresh Fruit. So although people talk about Time and Newsweek having those simultaneous oh, covers. Yeah. It should be Time, Newsweek, and Fresh Fruit. Fresh fruit. <laughs> and they put my name wrong on the story. They left it off the story, and on the contents page, they said, by Bob Flanagan. Jump forward to um, the Viacom days. What, what was your entree? What was the era? Was it, were, were you in with Judy? It was in the same building. Right. It was at 1515 Broadway. So it was more a case of, hey, all the MTV guys are moving in around us. And I, I kind of knew a lot of the people. I knew Judy McGrath. I knew gotcha. Tom Freston. I knew John Sykes. My pal Wayne Isaac told me he was going to go over to VH1, which sort of surprised me because he had a great gig as head of the uh, East Coast office for A&M Records. And again, we were in the same building. So, you know, I'd see Judy or Tom in the elevator and they'd say, hey, come by today. Um, so-and-so is going to was going to play in the cafeteria. So, so, you know, there was a friendship there. And, and occasionally, if we were out at a concert or at a dinner or something, they'd say, why don't you come over and work for us? And I was like, doing what? And there was never, you know, there was never an immediate answer. Well, just come over. We'll figure something out. So when, when John Sykes came in to kind of reinvent VH1 in 94, I had taken some time off from musician to write my U2 book. I traveled around the world with U2 on the Zoo TV tour. And when I came back to musician, I just thought, I'm done with this. I'm done with journalism. I'm done with music criticism. I've been doing it for 20 years. I'm out. And Freston said, well, just, you know, look, man, we're in the same building. Just give it a year. And, you know, I stayed 20 years. There's so many great lessons in that, including like just the value of relationships and right. Like, you know, don't look at your phone, turn to someone next to you and introduce yourself. Right. Yeah, I remember the first time I met John Sykes, I, I was actually impressed by that. We were backstage at some gig and he just walked up to me and said, Hey, Bill, I'm John Sykes. Good to meet yeah. you. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a smart thing to do. Well, for me as a music fan and a musician, like that is just, that's it. Right. Like to see a performance and gain the added context of the artist sharing Give us color on how that came to be. Well, you know, as JFK said, success has a thousand fathers. So <laughs> um, my memory of it is that Linda Corradina, who was my boss at the time, came in and picked up a copy of my book, Written in My Soul, which mm -hmm. was musicians talking about how they wrote their songs and said, could you do a TV version of this? And I said, yeah, okay. You know, and when I left Viacom a few years ago, I actually found the original memos. We went back and forth. And there were all different ideas that it was going to be a documentary about one song. It was going to tell the story of one song, or it was going to be this or that. And one of the last things, you know, and I remember saying, I worked with, uh, very closely with a fellow named Mike Simon on developing it. We thought, okay, it's just going to be the artist talking to the camera and I'll be behind the camera coaching him, but you won't hear me. It'll just be the artist talking to the camera and playing the songs. And not long before we did the pilot, we said, you know, we should have a few people there. Because mm. it's going to be really cold and it's going to be really serious if it's just the artist talking to an unseen interviewer. So we said, well, let's put 25 people in the room. And it was like, well, we might as well show them. And, you know, we thought there'd probably also be more jokes. The right. artists would play probably the play to the room a little bit. And so it, it developed, you know, very haphazardly. And um, I think that we were going to, I've never told Roger McGuinn this, we were <laughs> going to approach Roger McGuinn because he was do he was playing the Lone Star and places around kind of telling stories and, and playing songs. And then Ray Davis of the Kinks came to town with a one-man show 
that was playing for a week or so. And Mike and I went to see it and we said, well, you know, if we change this around a little bit, this could be um, a pilot for storytellers. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We approached Ray and he was very cautious about not giving away a lot of the stuff that was in his show. But we kind of um, jury rigged a version that was half what was in his show and half not and more of what we had wanted to do with McGuinn. And that became the pilot and that worked. And then we got an okay to do three more. And then it just went on and on and on and on for years. It went on until Ed Sheeran in 2014 or 15. What do you think you understand about artists or or the art or both that gives you sort of, you know, you joked with me once, you said, um, they keep me around because I can buzz up so-and-so, right? But it's obviously, Bill, that was self-effacing, right? Well, you know, I mean, I think I, I just listen closely as, mm. as most people do. It's a matter of really, really listening, you know, of not just reading clips from other things that have been written about somebody, mm. but sitting down with their albums and going through them meticulously from beginning to end and look for what themes recur. What are the subjects they keep coming back to? And if you really, really pay attention, you'll find things that are not obvious. Sometimes the artist will say, who told you that? Nobody ever picked up on that. You go, well, it's in your songs. Let's pivot a bit to all the books for heaven's sakes. I, <laughs> what a nerd I am. You know, I got them all in the bookshelves behind me. I got one right here for in a second. a r New Bedlam, Evening's Empire. And then the recent one, 50 in Reverse, which was so exciting to see, is the idea a catalyst for the imperative to sit down and type? Or do you have a, a deadline or some other imperative to type and then the idea follows? Or is it always different? No, I think it always starts with the idea. And I think that usually an idea sort of floats into your head and kicks around for a long time and starts kind of tugging at your sleeve before you recognize that it might be a story, let alone a book. And if the idea won't go away, then at some point you probably sit down and type out, you know, what is it? I don't know. You're just typing. You're just telling this story that came into your head. And A&R, the first novel, I think I wrote different first chapters for that for five or six or maybe even 10 years before I got to a second chapter and it started to become a book. But it is important to have a deadline once you know it is a book. Once you've written 50 pages and you know where it's going, then you really need to go get a book deal or else you would just write forever. You'd never nail it down. Do you have a ritual around how you approach your day-to-day? I think every book is different and every book teaches you how to write a book all over again. That's one thing that surprised me especially after your first novel, you think, now I know how to do it. And you start your second novel and you go, I don't know how to do it at all. Every book has to be discovered for itself. Every, every book demands a new map and you have to make the map as you write the book. Broadly speaking, across your, uh, you know, I guess mostly across your fiction, how has writing helped you make sense of your own experience at that time or in the past? Like how, did, how does it help you make sense of the life that you're living? I picked up my first novel, A&R, a couple of months ago, and I was looking at it, and I hadn't looked at it in a long time. And I thought, man, I could not write this book today. It was so frantic and so kind of packed with detail mm. and so fast moving that it was a reflection of how my consciousness was right. at the time I wrote it, which was in the middle of all the height of VH1. Get on a plane, go see Paul McCartney. Wait, you got to go down to see Elton John in Louisiana. Can you stop on the way in Nashville and talk with Johnny Cash? And, and, you know, it was just a frantic time. And the book has that kind of velocity to it. Whereas the new one, 50 in Reverse, is much shorter and much more leisurely because that's the way my life has been the last five years. I've been mainly in a, a house in Connecticut with a lot of land around. And I have more time to uh, look at small details of things. So 15 Reverse was the Wagner Brothers book club of the month for me, my dad, my brother and me. Oh, good. And I, and I thought you'd love that. My experience as a reader was it just had a different pace and sort of lightness and, and also clarity and efficiency. Efficiency is a good word for it because I really wanted it to be something that you could pick up on a rainy Sunday afternoon and, you know, finish at 11 o'clock that night and sort of have gone on the whole journey in a short period of time. We, we had a pragmatic, like, is question, is Peter dreaming forward as a child or dreaming 
backwards is he even alive i mean at the end of the day and i reread the end twice in the last few weeks it felt like it's kind of up to me is it up to me do you know the answer bill it's it's up to me and i don't know the answer because there is no answer you know i mean i kind of built the book so that you could read it several different ways and and that also involved taking out some stuff because i didn't want to tilt the uh, story i didn't want to tilt the reader in one direction or another i mean the the only for certain thing about the universe in that book is that the universe that he wakes up in in 1970 is the real world for as long as he's in it. Mm. And I think that's true for everybody. It's like the only world you can really count on is the world right in front of you. So what you think is going to happen or what you expect to happen or what you think happened before is in a way irrelevant. You've got to live in the world that you're faced with right now. And that's really the, what the book is about. Do you uh, sort of puzzle over the intersections between your characters and yourself, or do you sort of let it be or somewhere in between? No, I don't puzzle over it. I mean, the funny thing about fiction is that everybody wants to believe, and I do too, that if you really like a novel, that it's really the story of the novelist, that Charlie Brown is Charles Schultz and that Indiana Jones is, is George Lucas or something. And in a way, the novelist is trying to make you think that. The novelist is an illusionist. He wants to make you think that the story he's telling is true and it really happened and these are real people. And part of the way that he does that is he suggests in different ways that he is the person in the novel. And speaking for myself, I'm really not, but I understand that people want to believe that. Of course, the inverse of that is also true. When people write memoirs, <laughs> there's a desire to prove that they're fiction. And that's something that I just think is interesting about the human race. Especially given that the very nature of those sort of concepts are not as black and white as they would appear, or as might be suggested, right? That in fact, there's somewhere in between those two states that is actually most likely the case, whether no matter what, right? The author is his text. That's right. I mean, and that's, I think that's true with songwriters and everybody else. I mean, what's the songwriter really trying to do? He's not really trying to show you his diary. He's trying to write a good song. And from what I've seen of songwriters, they'll be pretty ruthless about mixing <laughs> fact and fiction and something they stole from an old movie they saw at 2 a.m. Yeah, and maybe make, another songwriter, yeah. Yeah, to make the song work. But then when he, when he or she is performing the song, they want to make you believe it happened to them, even if it's a song about the British kept it coming <laughs> at the Battle of New Orleans. You know, you want to kind of believe for the length of the song or the length of the story that it's, it really happened to the person. So I've kind of, um, I don't think anymore or worry anymore about people thinking the story is me or the story is not me. I just think that I just want to make the story work. Mm -hmm. And I'll pretty much use anything from my own life or anywhere else to make the story work. And that's what I guess I was trying to get at with you and your, with, with your fiction in particular, how you find that illuminates the sort of experience of being human and being alive. Do you know well, what I mean? Like when you yeah. looked back at Evening's Empire the other day. Well, the thing is that what is autobiographical about any work of fiction or song or a play or anything else is it tells you what the writer thinks is funny. It mm -hmm. tells you what the writer thinks is exciting. It tells you what the writer thinks is beautiful. It tells you what the writer is opposed to. Right. So in that sense, it's all autobiographical because it gives you an insight into the values of the person who's created it. And so the details, if you have an insight into someone's values, and their sense of beauty and their sense of honesty and their sense of humor, then whether or not the facts actually line up with their autobiography is pretty unimportant. Mm -hmm. Share with me for you, what is a perfect song? A Case of You by Joni Mitchell. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a pretty perfect song, perfect melody, perfect lyric, you know, beautiful metaphor, which she extends out. So, you know, that's one that pops into my head. When is a, uh, a moment that you've really experienced music uh, in, in its sort of fullest range of the human experience? Like when, what is a really profound, beautiful experience you've had with music that pops in your mind? Yeah, the resilience. I mean, I think you tend to remember early ones. I remember mm -hmm. going when I was 17 to see Van Morrison and the, his band and street choir play in Providence. And, uh, you know, it was probably Tupelo Honey was the most recent album and he was introducing songs that were going to be on St. Dominic's preview. And it just seemed like amazing that something so beautiful could live in the same world that my geometry class lived in, <laughs> you know, that you could, that you could get out of language lab and get in a car and drive 10 miles and there'd be Van Morrison singing Cypress Avenue. 
And then the next day you had to go back and, you know, run the track and gym class. But you're right, man. Like, God damn, like, you know, I remember buying my first REM import and I was like, what the fuck is this? And then I saw him in eyeliner and he's, you know, I'm in the front row and I can see saliva and it was visceral and real and so potent, you know? Yeah. It's always a, a great thing when you realize that these people live in the same world you do. Yeah. And of course, the first way you realize that is if you go into a room and see them in concert and they've come to your town, that's incredibly powerful. But it's also powerful when you just get over that notion that the people on the album covers or the people on the movie screen or the people who write the books are living on some other planet that you can never right. get to. Right. You know, it, it's it's uh, very comforting. What is the most unusual place your rock and roll career took you? Uh, the most unusual place my rock and roll career took me was lost in the Sahara Desert with a guide who luckily some local goat herders came up and said, you know, this guy is taking you across the border to Mauritania to sell you to Al Qaeda. And uh, they offered to kill him for us. And he ran away into the desert and uh, we turned our Jeep around and made it in the other direction. I remember you telling me about this in your office once. It was MTV days. And I went with Tom Freston, the CEO, and mm -hmm. Jimmy Buffett, Chris Blackwell, and a fellow named Jonathan Branstein, a couple other guys. I think there were six of us. And we wanted to go to the festival in the desert, which Robert Plant had told me about. And so we decided to go to Bamako. Anyway, we went to a lot of places in Africa on our way to the festival in the desert. We got to Timbuktu, which is the closest place to uh, where the festival takes place. We went down and hired a guy in the marketplace who said he knew the way. But it turned out he had another business opportunity yeah. going, which was to <laughs> sell stupid Westerners as hostages to Al Qaeda. You found the wrong guy in the we market. Found the, we found the wrong guy. Let that be a lesson to you. Oh get, a, get, a, get a GPS. The most unusual person you met. This was someone I did not meet. And I've been kicking myself ever since. Tom Freston and Bill Rohde, Bill Rohde ran MTV International, said, hey, you know, come on, man, we're taking the plane. We're going to Afghanistan where Tom used to live. And this was right after the invasion, the, the war had broken out. And I don't, I don't remember what dubious business reason we had for going to Afghanistan, but um, my wife and kids had an intervention and they said, you can't go to Kabul. They are blowing things up all the time. You know, you can't do it. They just said, if you love your family, you will say no to your boss on this. So I called Freston and said I was weaseling out. And he and Rhodey went off and they came back a week later. And I said, how was Afghanistan? And he said, oh, they wouldn't let us land. So we ended up going up into the uh, mountains and hanging out with the Dalai Lama for a week. And I said, well, all right, that's what I deserve. I wrote this part down because I wanted to be sure you heard me say it clearly that um, you've been kind to me. I'm so grateful to you for your inspiration, for your mentorship, for you sharing with me and for you showing up for me, man. By you just being there, it made me know I was going to be OK in a different way. So so thanks. Well, Benjamin, that's very good of you. You're a talented guy. I always knew you were going to be fine because you're a good person. You're a smart person and you work hard. So what could go wrong? I don't know if you heard it there at the end, but that was the sound of me being legitimately moved because Bill's the kind of guy you want to feel that way about you. And I don't know if you caught it when Bill said this, it's powerful when you get over the notion that the people on the album covers and the movie screen or who write the books are living on some other planet that you can never get to. When I was 15 years old, Rolling Stone was a salve for my adolescent angst. I hung on every issue. And in cover story after cover story, a rock star welcomed a journalist into his hotel room, sprawled on a couch, and inevitably overshared about whatever affliction, trauma, or adversity shaped them and their music. I identified with the rock star, wounded, melancholy, and irrepressibly expressive. But I became the journalist who moonlighted as the rock star, and I felt like neither. Worse, I felt outside both. Bill reminds us, though, that we're all the same. Bold-faced names and backstage fans alike. We're no more alone in our misery or melancholy than we are in our ambition or aspiration. Everybody hurts, and everybody wants to rule the world. Friends and Neighbors is a Wagner Brothers production. Download our podcast on Apple, stream it on Spotify, watch it on Facebook or YouTube, and subscribe to our newsletter at friendsandneighborshow.com. 
And if you're moved or inspired by what we're doing here, please, for heaven's sakes, rate, comment, and share friends and neighbors with your friends and neighbors. I'm Benjamin Wagner, and until next week, it's a good feeling to know we're lifelong friends. Ha, 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 ha.